Carl Sagan once said, The universe is a pretty big place. If it's just us, seems like an awful waste of space. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 554 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Why, yes, we are headed to space this week. My guest is Pratish Shah from AI Tech, and we're talking all about Space 2.0. We examine the role that COTS plays in Space 2.0 designs, the ruggedization design concerns that come along with these applications, and why Pratish believes that we will see a greater convergence of Milero and Space 2.0 engineering practices in the future. Also this week, I investigate the age-old question, are we alone in the universe? And how AI may have finally helped us unlock the mystery. But first, please welcome Pratish to Fish Fry. Hi Pratish, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. So you presented a session at the Embedded Tech Trends Conference this year called Enabling Space 2.0, Driving Affordability and Reliability in Space with Mill Arrow Cots. So first, Pratish, what exactly is Space 2.0? I'd say I think uh, we're living in Space 2.0. You know, for such a long time, space has been a very, very niche within a niche type industry. Today, you know, the launch is taking place every day. And what's driving Space 2.0 is an incredible drop in space launch cost, enabling new markets, new opportunities, and new business to grow in space. And therefore, Space 2.0 is a new type of business in space in which Mill Aerocots type solutions are applicable and can enable and continue to grow the space business. Let's dive into the COTS element here. So why is COTS so important when it comes to Space 2.0 and Milero designs? Sure, a good question. You know, one of the benefits of commercial off-the-shelf technologies and products is the fact that you've designed it, it's been tested and vetted, and then it can be flown and used repeatedly. In order to drive the volume growth that we're seeing in space, you can't build a solution, a custom solution each and every time. And what our customers are asking for is something that they can get to them faster, sooner, less expensive, and less NRE. And those are some of the criteria what COTS provides to them. And the reason why there's a uh, benefit of leveraging Mill Aero COTS is Mill Aero products and technologies are proven and used in uh, the Mill Aero type domain. And to take that technology, take those products and transitioning them for use in space builds on what's known and allows for the space customers to use readily available technology without embarking on costly and our rework. That makes sense. Now, both Mill Aero and Space 2.0 both demand specific levels of ruggedization. What kind of design considerations do you need to keep in mind when it comes to ruggedization for both of these industries? Yes. So I know many of us have been in the mill aero domain for such a long time. And when we talk about mill aero, it's not one size fits all. You know, it can be mill aero for some digital electronics cot solution that goes in a submarine or underwater. Could be something on a ship, could be on a man wearable platform, could be on a ground vehicle platform, could be an air platform. And in all these different domains, there's different ruggedization requirements that you work with. And if you're on an air platform, you deal with wide range temperatures and uh, shock and vibe that are different than a sea based platform. We add to that when you add space, you know, you now deal with different levels of uh, ruggedization requirements. So you still deal with shock and vibe, but now you have TVAC, thermal vacuum testing to understand the temperature range and support. Then you also deal with radiation. So for each domain that you're selling the product and technology into from underwater sea to space, it's understanding the ruggedization requirements and meeting them for the COTS products that you're delivering to the customer. So are you seeing a convergence of Milero and Space 2.0? Oh, very much so. And I think uh, as we uh, deliver more 
Milero products and make them applicable for space, we're seeing more of our customers wanting that pure COT solution that's proven for ready access to technologies and products that they can leverage and enable for use in space. So what is AI tech doing in this arena? So AI tech for 40 years has been in the male aero business and for 20 of those years we've been producing semi-custom and pseudo-custom space solutions. We are and we embarked in the last year or two transitioning and enabling many of our male aero products that proven in the male aero, air, ground, etc. domains and converting them and making them enable and usable in the space domain. So whether it's an AI engine based on an NVIDIA GPGPU or it's a network switch or even a Intel-based single board computer, these are all mill aero products that began and are proven in the mill aero domain, have now flown or will be flown in space in the not too distant future. Excellent. All right, Pratish, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world. Do you need a passport to get there? What would you have? Oh, oh no, that's an easy one. I'm a lobster fan. So, nice. you know, I spent a lot of time in Boston and lobster is like it's your staple. So for me, I'll have lobster anytime, anywhere I go. That sounds good. So, Pratish, follow-up question. Is this a lobster roll or is this the pull-it-apart piece-by-piece deal? Oh, no, you got to work for it. So tear it apart piece-by-piece, you know, with the bib and all. But, of course, you know, I will do with the lobster roll if that's the only option. (laughs) Ah, Me too. Well, Pratish, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Have you heard of the holy grail of astrobiology? Oh yes, my friends. We may have just found a way to determine if life on other planets exists. With the help of AI, of course. So get this. A team of researchers from the Carnegie Science Earth and Planets Laboratory, led by Jim Cleves and Robert Hazen, have released new findings that show that their AI-based method can now, with a 90% accuracy, distinguish both modern and ancient biological samples from abiotic samples. So how does this map back to life on other planets? Well, Dr. Hazen puts it succinctly like this. He says, This routine analytical method has the potential to revolutionize the search for extraterrestrial life and deepen our understanding of both the origin and chemistry of the earliest life on Earth. It opens the way to using smart sensors on robotic spacecraft, landers, and rovers to search for signs of life before the samples return to Earth. So, where should we start? Well, this team from Carnegie Science says, right here on Earth. They contend that this new method could reveal the origins of ancient and mysterious rocks here on Earth. From there, Mars. This team also contends that we could use this new test to analyze samples collected by Mars Curiosity Rover's Sample Analysis at Mars, or SAM, instrument. And even further, we could also conduct these tests on board the rover as well. But in order to utilize SAM, this team will need to change the method slightly to match the protocols of the instrument. But Dr. Hazen and his team believe that they might already have the data on hand to determine if molecules on Mars are organic from the Martian biosphere. Okay, so let's talk about the test itself. So this new method does not rely solely on identifying a group of compounds or a specific molecule in a sample. Instead, this AI method actually differentiates abiotic and biotic samples using a pyrolysis gas chromatography analysis, which separates and identifies a sample's component parts. In order to detect small differences within a sample's molecular patterns, 
This is then followed by mass spectrometry, which determines the molecular weights of those compounds. This team used the molecular analysis of 134 abiotic or biotic carbon-rich samples to train this AI method to predict a new sample's origin. And with an accuracy of around 90%, this method was able to identify samples as living things like modern shells, teeth, bones, insects, leaves, rice, even human hair, and cells preserved in fine grain rock, like remnants of ancient life altered by geological processing, like coal, amber, or carbon-rich fossils, or as samples with abiotic origins, such as pure laboratory chemicals like amino acids and carbon-rich meteorites. So the remnants of ancient life was especially interesting to me because until now, ancient carbon-bearing collections of organic materials have been rather hard to determine due to their degradation over time. But despite decay and alteration over time, this new analytical method was able to detect signs of biology preserved in some instances over hundreds of millions of years. Wow. So Dr. Hazen explains the heart of the research like this. We began with the idea that the chemistry of life differs fundamentally from that of the inanimate world. That there are chemical rules of life that influence the diversity and distribution of biomolecules. If we could deduce those rules, we could use them to guide our efforts to model life's origins or to detect subtle signs of life on other worlds. These results mean that we may be able to find a life form on another planet, another biosphere, even if it is very different from life we know on Earth. And if we do find signs of life elsewhere, we can tell if life on Earth and other planets derived from a common or different origin. To put it another way, this method should be able to detect alien biochemistries as well as Earth life. This is a big deal because it's relatively easy to spot the molecular biomarkers of Earth life. But we cannot assume that alien life will use DNA, amino acids, etc. Our method looks for patterns in molecular distributions that arise from life's demands for functional molecules. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how amazing this AI model is. So this team from Carnegie originally trained it to predict just two samples, abiotic and biotic, but it actually discovered three different populations, abiotic, living biotic, and fossil biotic. Dr. Hazen addresses this aspect of their research like this. This surprising finding gives us optimism that other attributes, such as photosynthetic life or cells with a nucleus, might be distinguished. Don't you love when your work is even cooler than you thought it would be originally? <laughs> so lead author Jim Cleves of the Earth and Planets Laboratory Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, D.C., says this about this innovative research study. He says, The implications of this new research are many, but there are three big takeaways. First, at some deep level, biochemistry differs from abiotic organic chemistry. Second, we can look at Mars and ancient Earth samples to tell if they were once alive. And third, it is likely that this new method could distinguish alternative biospheres from those of Earth with significant implications for future astrobiology missions. 
Super, super, super cool, right, my friends? So if you want even more information about this study or to investigate Space 2.0, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, Sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of October 20th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>